you guys. It's so um, exciting to be here today, and um, I hope everybody enjoyed lunch. Um, it's one of my favorite things, especially when it's cold outside. I, I went back and forth between box lunches and, and a hot meal, and I was like, oh, I just don't want to feed them sandwich. Um, so I'm Sabrina, and I work with Hospice of West Tennessee. Um, we're a part of West Tennessee Healthcare, sort of the um, home care hospice arm of the hospital. We are a nonprofit hospice. And I was trying to decide what to do exactly um, because most everybody knows what hospice is, um, but just digging down into the nitty gritty of we have a palliative care program. I want to make sure we kind of talk about the difference between hospice and palliative care today. So I invited our um, my coworker, Miss Jana Haskins Casey, and she is one of our nurse practitioners at Hospice of West Tennessee. She works alongside Dr. Pinks and goes out to the home and sees our patients. So um, Jana's been with us for about a year, almost a year, and uh, I've learned so much from Jana and continue to learn and look forward to hearing what she has to share with us today. So again, thank you um, for allowing us to speak today and Jana. So thanks for having me, guys. Thanks for showing up. Um, I'll go ahead and introduce myself. I'm Jana Haskins. Obviously, I'm one of the providers, nurse practitioners, work alongside Dr. Coons at Hospice of West Tennessee. I do have previous experience in outpatient palliative care from another company. And altogether, I have about five years of experience in hospice and palliative care. Prior to that, I did work as a RN case manager and held several different roles within the organization as an RN. Um, so we're going to talk today about understanding hospice and palliative care. A lot of people don't understand the difference in the two. Um, they are very similar, but there is a lot of difference as well. And I will be honest, before I even got into palliative care, I didn't truly really understand uh, the difference between the two. And even when I started it, I, there was a lot I didn't understand that I kind of learned along the way. So just some statistical data about, you know, the need for hospice. You know, 25% of deaths do occur at home, but more than 80% of Americans do say that they would prefer to die at home. And 70% of end-of-life care, or 70% of people do say that they would like their end-of-life care provided at home, but we do find that over 50% of people do die at the hospital, unfortunately. Um, and with that, we have to think about the aging population, the baby boomers, kind of what's expected over the next couple of years. We do have people who are 65 and older. There's 81% of those people that have multiple chronic comorbidities, including heart disease, um, lung disease, cancer, those types of things that do age and will need hospice or palliative services in the future. Um, there was 1.6 million Medicare beneficiaries in hospice in 2018, and we have seen about a 4% 4, 4 increase every year. Um, the leading diagnosis is for what we're seeing in hospice care. Obviously, cancer is number one. We're seeing number two is heart disease, and number three is Alzheimer's or dementia. So a little statistical data about palliative care. Approximately 6 million people over the United States will need palliative care services or could benefit from them. Um, if the hospitals united across the nation, we could save about $6 billion per year in medical costs by just implementing palliative care services. And when I did outpatient palliative care, the big focus and the drive behind that, we worked well with a hospital system was to um, hopefully not have that patient readmitted to the hospital, especially within the 30-day window. So that was something we looked at specifically to kind of cut down the cost and relieve the burden on healthcare. And I worked with them during COVID. And so it's really nice to have us, you know, maybe we could implement an antibiotic or a steroid or something just to keep some of those patients out of the hospital and relieve the burden from them. Um, and 92% of people on a poll did say they would be open to enrolling their loved one in palliative care services. So I know you guys can read, but obviously what's the definition of end of life care? So it involves spiritual, emotional, physical, um, and it's provided to a patient and their family by an interdisciplinary team. And that involves, um, you know, end of life care involves palliative and hospice care. So to understand hospice care, what do we do? So sometimes this is not working, sorry. It provides support and care to the patient and the families at a life-limiting diagnosis. It recognizes dying as a part, as a normal part of living. 
And I know a lot of people think that, oh, you know, we're trying to change the image of hospice, but a lot of people think hospice speeds up the dying process. And that's not true. So, you know, we, we don't postpone death and we don't um, make it happen quicker. You know, we're trying, it's changed a lot over the years of what hospice and palliative care is. And it's, we're trying to change that image within the community. And a lot of people are more open to it now than what they used to be. And the focus is always on quality of life and improving that in the patient, whether that's symptom managed or helping the pay, relieve the burden off the family, those kind of things. So the core aspects of hospice is obviously a person, patient, and family-centered approach. We, are, um, we have an interdisciplinary team. And the services that we provide are durable medical equipment, pharmaceuticals, supplies, volunteers, grief support. And where do we provide that care? So obviously hospice is provided and it can be provided at home. It can be provided in a residential care facility like nursing homes, assisted living. We provide inpatient hospice care at the hospital. We do it a couple different places. We are in Dyersburg right now, Martin, um, and then obviously Jackson. But we do hope to expand to other places fairly soon. We have caregiver training. That's a big thing is trying to educate the caregivers because we can't be there 24 seven. So some of that is on them and they need to be able to know what to do in situations that may arise. And a big thing that we do is provide community bereavement services for 13 months following the patient's death. So on the next slide, you'll see, you know, who is in our interdisciplinary team. So we have nurses. Um, we have a great volunteer program that Melissa runs for us. Um, some of those volunteers, you know, have had have experienced personal experience with hospice before. And so they just have a, a big heart for this type of services. We have physician, obviously, Dr. Coons, nurse practitioner, myself, counselors, social workers, spiritual bereavement, hospice aides. So we're all constructed of a big group of people and we all get together each week and have an interdisciplinary team meeting and speak about each patient and what's going on with them so we can ha have the highest level of care for them. So what do the nurses do? What do we do? So we develop plans of care, symptom management, obviously, you know, big ones are pain, nausea, constipation, those types of things. You also want to be there for them emotionally, spiritually, psychosocial. We teach the family, again, like I said, how to provide the care. We advocate for the patient and the family, and we provide bereavement care and counseling. Um, there's multiple different places we can provide the care. The main one usually is at a home setting. Doesn't mean it has to be the patient's home. It could be a loved one or anybody willing to provide that level of care for them. It can be at a nursing facility, assisted living facilities, hospital, um, hospice residential units, or wherever the person is located. You know, we've had people who were homeless before that we provide hospice care for. So we, um, we can provide it anywhere where they are. We meet them where they are. Who pays for it? So obviously you got your big payer source, the main one that most hospice companies have is Medicare, but we also, there is Medicaid, there's private insurances, private pay, and sometimes there's a combination of all. If they're in a nursing home, you know, they have a payer source for room and board and somebody else is paying for the, the hospice related services. So also hospice with Tennessee, I'm sure most of you know, is a not-for-profit hospice organization and we do take patients without insurance um, and provide the same level of care that anyone would get. What's the admission criteria for hospice? So to qualify for hospice, you have to have a life-limiting diagnosis with an expectation of six months or less. That doesn't mean that at the six months mark, um, I jokingly tell my patients, you know, after six months, if you're still living, we're not just going to boot you off hospice. You just have to keep, continue to qualify and show declines, even if it's gradual. You have to obviously live in our service area, consent to the services, and forego any medical treatment for the terminal illness. I know that's a little confusing. But if it's totally unrelated, we still let them go and see, you know, if they're on for a certain thing and then they need to go and see a cardiologist, but they're on for something totally different, unrelated, they can still go and see their cardiologist. It's billed a little differently on their insurance, but they still can go and get services that's unrelated to their terminal illness. And I know that's a little confusing. So understanding palliative care. So it's similar in the sense that we want to enhance comfort and quality of life. In an individual who's facing a terminal or life-limiting illness. And the big thing I saw when I did outpatient palliative care, I would walk into a patient's home and me just having the experience of hospice and palliative care, I knew that these patients probably had six months or less to live and they probably were more appropriate for hospice level of care, but they weren't willing to 
be ready for that. That's a big step to take. And they just needed more for me, more than even symptom management and thing was just the emotional guidance to that, to try to get them to the point where, you know, we, we call, we talk about hospice. What does it look like? What are you scared of? You know, but I knew that they typically would need hospice services at some time in their illness. And I really think by implementing the palliative care, it helped them get there and be more accepting of them and build that rapport with them. So that was a big thing that I did. Um, and obviously, you know, just uh, relieve distress, symptom management, pain management, and quality of life, just like hospice is. Um, so that part is very similar. Um, you know, there's three different kinds of care. There's curative care, people who are looking to cure their illness, prolong their life. There's palliative care, who also focuses on comfort and quality of life. But the big thing in that is they can still have palliative care in combination with curative treatments. I had several patients who were still undergoing dialysis, chemotherapy, different things like that. And, you know, we provided, you know, pain management or just an extra set of eyes out in the home to help the physicians feel a little bit more comfortable with their patient. You know, maybe they can only see them every few months, but we could go monthly or twice a month and just keep an extra set of eyes on them. And that really did um, appear to make a big difference. So and then hospice care obviously is focusing on comfort, quality of life when a cure when a cure is not possible, and um, you know that's a terminal illness and they need to elect hospice services. So what kind of services do we offer? And I kind of went over this um, routine home care. We do inpatient level of care GIP, like I said, at, at multiple different facilities throughout this region. And that is, we can, we can admit somebody at the hospital that's a new patient to inpatient services. We can have a patient who's at home or different, uh, different areas that's already on our services. We can admit them. That's for the patients that we cannot control their symptoms in an outpatient setting. And they have to be in an inpatient setting, whether it be a respiratory device that they're needing, um, IV medications. You know, if we can't manage it at home, we're going to put them in the appropriate level of care to manage their symptoms effectively. And then we do have right now, unfortunately, we don't have an outpatient palliative care program with our hospice company. Um, that's something that we hope to develop. And I think that was a big reason why um, Shelly, our director, wanted to kind of have me on board because I do have that previous experience and hopefully can help get that on the ground. I don't know if, uh, you know, the time frame on that, but we do have an inpatient palliative care consult service at the hospital. Um, we have a physician and two nurse practitioners that consult with our patients that do a wonderful job, again, at preparing them for what maybe the future looks like. And sometimes they walk in and maybe they're the first ones that's actually just said how sick your family member is and what, you know, the next couple of days or weeks or hours will even look like. So they do a really good job um, at preparing people for those things. Um, so is there any questions? I know I talk fast. I've always been bad about that. <laughs> Um, is there any questions about the difference or services that we offer or anything like that? Go ahead. I have a question. Um, you said you start homeless individuals. How do you provide the services? We have, um, you know, we can obviously social workers work with maybe getting them into a facility. Um, I have been told in the past we had a homeless patient and I don't know, I think they provided maybe had a central location that they provided visits for. We had we had a homeless lady come on service with us um, recently, um, and we there was actually we were blessed enough that one of her close friends took her in and provided the care there for her. So we try to find obviously somebody that will take them if possible. But I mean, I have I have heard, like I said, it hasn't been since I've been there that we have had homeless patients before, and we try just you know maybe they're at a homeless shelter, maybe you know try to meet them somewhere where we can provide that care, but. Uh, Thankfully, that has not happened while I've been there, and we were able to have a friend, like I said, take in that other lady that was kind enough to provide the care. And it seemed like back before COVID hit and everything, it seemed like y'all were working on maybe having a hospice house. Yeah, we on? expected that question, mm -hmm. um, and I know Sabrina has talked to some of the people that are kind of driving that at the hospital and maybe has more of a timeline for you i mean we're really excited about it but i don't know did were you able to speak to anybody that kind of i didn't talk to we have to fundraise and yeah. that's one of the um, wonderful things i guess about um, being a nonprofit. Mm -hmm. it's going to be a community-based mm -hmm. okay effort and so 10 million dollars is what it's going to cost to uh, break ground and they're they're raising money and we get donations all the time i know 
Uh, a lot of us as employees mm -hmm. have joined. Um, yeah, we have a, a, out of our paychecks yeah, to try to help a we care system. program. Yeah. yeah. And I think that's hospital wide. I don't think, unfortunately, it's not specifically to the hospice house, but it funds all of a lot of stuff at West Tennessee Healthcare. A lot of people in our office give a good amount of money each paycheck because, it, you know, we're passionate about that. That's why we work for a nonprofit. And, you know, the idea behind the hospice home, um, it's not something that I personally have had any experience with. I've had patients or excuse me, family members who've been patients of hospice. But, um, you know, you just think about those cases that we see where um, the family members are just as, just as sick, really, as the patient that's on hospice. Mm -hmm. They can't provide the care. Or they have no body. Mm -hmm. They have no body. And that would be great for, you know, like if we did get a homeless individual. We, I mean, exactly. they won't be trying to hunt somebody to take care of them. We'll put them in our hospice house and they'll be well taken care of and not have to worry about that. So Not everybody has the resources to go into a nursing home or the time to get everything situated to get into a nursing home. Um, so it's just sort of, it's um, going to be there for, it's going to replace our GIP services. So if somebody had to have high flow oxygen in the hospital, they can have high flow oxygen at the hospice house and be in a home like setting versus being mm -hmm. in the hospital with all the nurses and all the blood pressure checks and everything. Yeah. So, you know, it's just a completely different environment. And um, we're planning to break ground this year. That's still the plan, um, but she's, she's still got a little ways to go on fundraising. So any of y'all have big pockets. We're still accepting <laughs> donations. Just write me a check today, right? <laughs> But yeah, the hospice house. We is say almost place. weekly, you know, like this is, we like she said, we get so many patients that just don't have caregivers or they're elderly or sick and can't take care of them. And I couldn't tell you how many times, I don't know, I'm sure all of y'all know Dr. Smith. He's pretty well known around here. The Dr. Smith <coughs> says, this is just the perfect patient for a hospice house. And so, um, and Dr. Kent says the same thing. So, you know, we're really pushing for it and we're trying because it's, it's a big need here. There's nowhere between Nashville and Memphis. And this is a big area that needs to be served. So we look forward to that. We have a lot of plans in the future. We just got to implement them and get there. Any other questions? Go ahead. I have two questions. One is, do you guys do some kind of evidence-based model on the front end with your intake to determine what matters the most to these folks on We usually, uh, not really an evidence base, but we do, you know, we all go out within the first five days of admission to see what their spiritual needs are. You know, the social workers go out and go over any paperwork, you know, FMLA, anything that needs to be done. So um, I don't know of a specific model. I'm sure there is one, and I probably should know that, but we go out just individually and try to figure out what their needs are and then we have a meeting on them that week and talk about you know this is what we need this is where we're at with things so all of us just have a different responsibility and job then we just figure out what each person needs because it is different okay and then what kind of services are you offering within that so you may know a little bit more about that than i do mm -hmm. um and actually <laughs> i put on everybody's table we have i mean hot off the press mm -hmm. we just um, have a brand new bereavement brochure um our bereavement pro program follows the patient like she mentioned for 13 months after they have the option to select out opt out um but the bereavement, bereavement counselor is going to be available to them one-on-one -on -one. normally pre-covid and hopefully post-covid um support groups, which bereavement support groups are phenomenal. It's just like anything else. You need to know that you're not alone in what you're going through. Um, but all of that, that kind of question is answered here in the bereavement brochure. We do mm -hmm. have a, a bereavement program where they mail out, they call and check on you. And if you, you know, really have mm -hmm. some needs, they, they provide one-on-one -on -one support and counseling for that. Grief is a huge part of what yes. we do. And um, even having had, before I came on to hospice of West Tennessee's team, I had a family member on hospice. And I, I wasn't really, I was still a kid. It was my dad. So um, I didn't really realize everything that happened after the fact. Um, and, and that's something a lot of people miss the boat on. It's not just for the patient. The families benefit from hospice just as much, if not more so. Mm -hmm. There's always somebody to call. 
You can call 24-7. It doesn't matter if it's on night, the middle of the night or weekends. We're there for you. We encourage questions because most of the time, families don't have a clue what's going on. They don't know what to expect. They freak out, and they need to know that somebody can answer the phone and answer those questions. And I have um, Darren, one of our um, bereavement social worker people. She wears multiple hats there. Um, she has told me that there was one patient's family that we had, I mean, on for years. She yeah. talked to that lady weekly for years because, mm -hmm. you know, she just didn't have anyone to talk to. And so her and Darren really bonded and she called her weekly for years. And so, I mean, it, it isn't just 13 months. Most people, 13 months, yes. But if we feel like they need us beyond that, we're not going to just drop them. And like she said, I do often find that, you know, if they are on for six months, a lot of times the patient is ready to go. They're okay with it. It's not really so much them as it is the family. They're not ready to let them go, you know. So they really, in my eyes, need us more than the patient even does, especially afterwards, because that's a difficult time. Do you, everybody, you have everybody coming and visiting in the first couple of weeks, and then, I don't know, everybody moves on with their life, and they forget what you've been through. So, Something she mentioned that I wanted to hit on, too, is uh, Melissa Pipkin's our volunteer coordinator, and um, a lot of people are like, what in the world is wrong to do the positive? It's not always just one-on-one -on -one patient care. Sometimes volunteers do office work. Sometimes they assist with mail out. Sometimes they do tucking calls mm -hmm. um, just to check and make sure how everything's going. <coughs> Promise you it's not perfect. <laughs> but um, our, you know, our team um, just works really hard to make sure that the patient's needs are met. And when there's someone that needs that home services, I know we've got, um, you know, what I'm trying to think that we have at home services besides home health. I'm talking about at home. Advanced choice. Yeah, advanced choice. I was like, I know I'm saying it, but I can't remember where he's sitting. But, um, yeah, you know, if they need home care, we've got a list, and we talk to them about, you know, what their options are. It's definitely something that um, the volunteers uh, play a huge role in um, helping us as staff meet all those needs. And we also, one of the volunteers <coughs> has a pet, right? Do yeah, pet, pet therapy. Pet therapy. Two things, my favorite parts, and I'm promise I'm not going to get off on the um, soapbox on this, but my favorite parts of volunteer that is the pet therapy and the music therapy. We partner with the Star Center, and so if there are special types of music, we have uh, the musicians that will go out and they'll sing and play the guitar and do different things, whether it be at a facility or whether it be at their home. And sometimes, if, you know, there's all kinds of virtual options. I know if, um, if the family's not comfortable with somebody new coming in their house, they can do it over like a FaceTime type thing. But y'all, I have I have two dogs in my house, and I love animals. Um, sometimes, especially in facilities, if they had animals when they were growing up, when they were had their own home, and now they've been in a nursing home for several years, and they miss that. So we have uh, one particular volunteer, Don, who has a dog, Simon, and he is a schnauzer. I don't know what he is. Yeah. They even dressed up for Halloween. He it was the cutest thing. Up. He's got more clothes than I do. He has got a doctor's outfit, like a Santa suit. I put it on Facebook. And again, marketing, you can't take the marketer out of me. Follow us on Facebook because we're always putting our stuff out there. Um, so you can see what all we're involved in. Mm -hmm. We're here, there, and everywhere. And we did have a campaign recently where that one day everybody who donated to West Tennessee Healthcare, like We Care or whatever, was specifically for the hospice house. And I don't know if they'll do that again, but we had a whole day of just fundraising. And I it think we had a goal. By, it was a company that matched what, um, what was donated that day. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I want to say we got like twenty something thousand dollars. I mean, that was like forty, fifty thousand dollars in that one day that we fundraised for mm -hmm. the hospice house. So that's, that's kind of how you keep up with what we're doing. If you're interested in that and updates. Any more questions? I have one. Yes. Mm -hmm. The word hospice is just you know, Dad. We put him in hospice. Mm -hmm. I understand the word because mm -hmm. I work at home health. Yeah. And you know, as a therapist, but. When I said that word hospice to his wife, he was just like, oh, mm -hmm. so what can you say? There are some times where um, the patient's family just requests not to say the mm -hmm. word hospice. You know, we say home care, 
comfort care. There's other okay. ways around, around it because, you know, the word hits hard. I know. Um, so, you know, sometimes they do request because I just feel like maybe they'll give up if we tell them they're on yeah. hospice. So, um, and, and you know, oftentimes if they're with it, they figure it out. But by the time we've built that rapport with them and they see that we're not there to in their life, you know, those kind of things. We're just there to provide the support and comfort they need. A lot of times they're open to it. So mm -hmm. we may not start off with, hey, we're hospice, mm -hmm. you know. We just start off with, hey, we're here to help you and help your family, get you home, those kind of things. So, it's like work, and then it's like, oh, can we refer to the yeah. hospital? Yeah, I just had a patient oh, yesterday at the hospital, and the, the wife, um, he was a young man, so she just asked me not to say the word. Yeah. So, you know, I yeah. just told him, I said, we're going to get you home, or I'll make sure that you're comfortable. Yeah. And and he probably figured out who I was with. Mm -hmm. um, he probably put two and two together, but he was okay with it. So, sometimes we just use different terms yeah. yeah, if that's their request, but, mm -hmm. you know, only by their request. Mm -hmm. And the palliative care program helps with that too, mm -hmm. because the word palliative care, I think it confuses people enough because they don't, they don't know exactly yeah. what that means. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, just making sure that you're comfortable, and making sure that your your needs are met, um, and then you're not in pain, mm -hmm. um, is the most important thing. So, I think that's it. Well, Unless yeah. you guys have more questions. Thanks a million, you guys. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. February the 10th. I know the district here already has about 15 folks that are coming, so thank you. We have comfortable seating for 40, but it can be extended to 60, okay? And so that's going to be a great fundraiser. If you and some girlfriends want to come, you can take your 50% that we're going to receive and put it towards your fundraiser goal. So if you're working to a $200 to get the max incentives, you can have that money to go to your time as well. So just know that. Um, so here's a flyer. So ASAP, you can get these to me. Second thing, really quick, February the 22nd is our legislative day. <laughs> if you want to make the trek with me, uh, I know Jaleesa has signed up to go and has been in the past. If you want to ride with us, we're going to knock on the doors. And Renee, yep, knock on the doors of legislators and our senators. This year, we're really focusing about Silver Alert. You guys have heard that where we are. We did give them all certificates of everyone that signed on. But they want us to be back in their door. They want us to be talking about the topics that matter. And so that day is February the 22nd. We will be leaving this um, parking lot at Kroger over by Home Instead. I don't know what that street is. At West Parkway? University, University Parkway. Parkway. We're going to be meeting there at 630. I know that's early, but we have to be parked in Nashville by 9 to start seeing visits at 930. I will make those appointments for you. I will feed you. I will give you treats. I will love on you. And then we'll come back. Okay, so that is that. Any questions about either one of those? You can sign up on the website as well. You probably want to use that email. Um, you can sign up with that. So thank you guys. Do we have to turn this in today? You can turn this in today. If you want to sign up for the pottery class, you do need to make checks payable to Union Station Pottery because they're going to turn around that night and just write us a check from them. So we can get the 50%. 
It is a $35. Um, it's going to be a great class. There's, uh, you can pick your selective mug in about a week or two after you can go by and pick it up or I can deliver it to you. And we're going to have ABL creations with a lot of yummy treats there too. So you will not walk away and start. So, thank you. Anybody else? Now don't make it easy. No, please. Please. <laughs> please. <laughs> please. <laughs> please. <laughs> please. <laughs> and if anybody wants to sign up for one of our meetings, I've got July and September open. So. You got the medical center down in June. Yes, mm -hmm. August. August 3rd. August 3rd. Okay. So y'all can always email me when we have a and I'll usually, here and there, I'll send out if I have any open. So I've got this mm -hmm. in we appreciate Summer. She does a fantastic job. Just a couple of things from here really quick. Um, we do have an opening in our treatment department. This is our collaborative response to elder and vulnerable adult abuse program. If you know someone who might have a part um, for victims of uh, crime, um, Dana has been in that position and, and filled that position for us. She's moved into another capacity here. So an elder abuse advocate is what we are hiring. They can send their resumes to me. We'll also be hiring a Meals on Wheels coordinator for our region. Our current um, Meals on Wheels director, her name is Holly. Right? She was the center director in Selmer, senior center director for about 30 years, and she's been with us for the last five, doing Meals on Wheels for our entire region. She's going to be a huge loss um, to us, but retires at the end of March, so I'll be accepting resumes for that position which is a uh, house in this office. It coordinates the meals, uh, getting folks on and off and delivering those meals, working with the food provider. Um, I'll be accepting those resumes beginning in February. Also in February, we have my Rochester County hoping to kick off, I believe, on Valentine's Day. We're so excited. We've been working quite a while in Chester County to get that program started. Older adults in that county can utilize the volunteer transportation there. We will come all the way to South Jackson, Walmart, and to the Jackson Clinic South. I believe so it comes in Midland Island County. Um, but we're excited to have that option for folks who need hands-on assistance in transportation. Also, hope to be starting our two programs in McNary <coughs> County in February. Um, the McNary County programs are hybrid for us. I think we've talked about them before. They're called My Right Plus. Um, one of the programs stays within the county for older adults, and the other one is, is it interesting to me because it's meeting a, a service camp of veterans who do not qualify for um, paid reimbursed transportation through the VA, um, but to get them to um, Savannah, Memphis, or Nashville uh, to the VA uh, clinics and services there. So we're excited about that. Our ARP Toyota cars are hopefully these two will be in service in McNary County uh, for those two hybrid programs, plus volunteers in their own vehicles, so we're excited about that. Um, some legislation, of course, the legislator, the legislation, um, General Assembly went back in session yesterday. The only thing we've heard of aging in is Alzheimer's Association is looking to um, provide services specifically uh, for persons who are on our options wait list. You might have Alzheimer's disease to prioritize those folks. I don't know if it'll pass. It's been on the floor. Um, there continues to be efforts around elder abuse. I appreciate Amanda mentioned the silver alert bill. I heard just this week um, from the director here at the commission that um, of the 40 some odd silver alerts that have been issued uh, since the TBI took over the program, all 40 some odd persons have been recovered. Unfortunately, I believe two were already deceased. Um, but they have done an excellent job, just like an Amber Alert, except with an older adult or a vulnerable adult. Sometimes you'll see younger people under 60 who they issue a silver alert for. But that has made such a huge difference in the state, and uh, we're thankful for that. So, any questions on that or concerns? I would just add to that. All of our is going to be at the Sheriff's Association conference at the end of the month on the 25th and 26th. That's going to give us a really across the board one on one meetings with all of our sheriffs to be able to personally say thank you. How can we come in and educate just on the general? And then how can we continue to partner with TBI? So we're really thankful they invited us to come. So just know you're going to be represented on state lines with our sheriffs too. That's wonderful. And if you have an interest in elder justice, um, elder justice conference happens usually annually in Tennessee. It is in Gatlinburg in May. If you want more information on that, let me know. They've got some great uh, nation or nationally recognized speakers 
and then to talk about elder abuse and elder justice issues, and it's always a good two days of, of really intense. <coughs> Um, so that's wonderful. Questions? Okay. I want to say something. So, uh, first of all, thank you very much for you guys. Because well, my name is Michael I'm from JRAB Physical Therapy. We have a small outpatient somewhere there downtown, oh no, uh, Thompson Farm. But uh, I just want to thank you guys because you guys are doing a great job. Every single one of you, you are making a life changing thing. I just coordinated with Miss Amanda there. She's like amazing person. And we also Miss Sabrina in. You feel like you may feel like you're doing nothing. I was like, oh, I'm just sitting down here, but you're doing something really. And I see it in every single post that you do. So uh, uh, in, in the emails that I get from this summer, it's just amazing. Use those resources. So if you want to use those resources, I have a group called Alzheimer's and Dementia Support Group. Ms. Lee and Ms. Uh, Sabrina probably knows this. We have 36, 36, see my English. I'm running out of English. It's way past my English time. <laughs> oh, if you hear me speaking, I'm not speaking in tongues, okay? <laughs> we have 30, 36,000 members in that group needing help and assistance. It may not be here in Jackson, but if you come in and, you know, I want to interview you in our little show, uh, we provide them and share your services, they might know. I have some people there who reached out to me about the, the MyRide thing. It's like for $45, $35 a year? $45 a year? $2? I mean, imagine that. I mean, so I've been sending those information to some of my clients uh, that we have in the clinic. It's just amazing services. Use each one. I'm not saying use each one, but, you know, utilize each one here. I've been utilizing everything, everybody here. Uh, we're not competition here. We're coordinating with each other. So I just want to share that. So. Well, it's great that you provide other resources, you know, look for other resources for the patient outside yeah. of physical therapy. Yeah, That's yeah. Awesome. So Thank we are you. all technically case managers for each one of our clients. Well, nothing against you, those real case managers, but you know what I mean? We take care of them. So. All right, thank you. We wear a lot of hats, don't we? Thank you, Molly. Do we want to go around the ring? Because I see some people that I don't know, and I mean, Mike, just do you want to introduce yourself and y'all start? Yeah, that would be great because we're live right now. <laughs> Hello, everyone, we are live. Anybody wants to introduce themselves? Maybe on this table here. Yeah, so, hi, my name is Adam Reeves. I'm from Miami. I'm a uh, student PT working under Dr. Mike Chulia. You have a good teacher? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> of course, if I die, I'll sell the other way. Hi, my name is Ul. I'm originally from South Korea, but I'm um, studying DPT school, uh, same as Adam in Miami, and working under Dr. Chua Carter. So. I'm Ada Barlow Leach with Alzheimer's Tennessee. Julissa Mason, Doctor Coordinator for Avalon Hospice. Renee Cord, Mrs. Bell, Bella, Director of Locker Center for Ste. Brenda Davis, owner of Golden News Love Day Care. Jennifer Ewing's Bureau of Health, Jackson and Carsburg. My name is Ada Lester. I'm the marketing director of the Dance Joy Home here. I'm Tasha Cox, and I'm the admissions marketing director for Henderson Elementary Hat. I'm Jennifer Mitchell, and I'm the Graph Account Executive for a Medical Center right now. Hi, and I'm Corey, and I am the patient liaison for the new facility that's coming in the Dallas Christian Care Center. I'm Sabrina Abbott, I'm the administrator at Wesley Falcon Place in London. We didn't take this tackle back here, did we? Did y'all have one? I'm John Roberts. I'm the uh, administrator for Care Self Care in Miami. I'm with you, Holmes. I'm the choice of nurse here. I'm Dana Holmes. I'm the MIPA coordinator here. I'm Shelly Kelly, the director here. I'm Jordan Wilson. I'm with the options for Madison County. Summer Kyle. I'm the AAA administrative assistant. You've heard from us, Sabrina with Hospice of West Tennessee, Jana with Hospice of West Tennessee, Melissa, the Welcome Care Coordinator at Hospice of West Tennessee, Stephanie Hill, I'll flip Hospice of West Tennessee for 20 years. And I'm we, really we, we miss her, we're so glad to be here today. We have to see her, but I know we have to leave place on how. As the new service coordinator. I'm Alexa Stringer, I'm the service coordinator at West Tennessee. Better fight. 
All right, thank you all. So we'll see our next, or we're the next coach, aren't we? Yes, yeah. yeah. on what day? It is February 2nd. So I wish you all the happiest of New Year's, and I thank you for coming today. Thank you.